In our last lecture on John Stuart Mill and his great work on liberty, we brought to a conclusion our discussion of the theme of government, responsibility, the duty of a citizen towards that government. And I think we can draw several conclusions from that discussion, which ranged all the way from the classical China of Confucius to the Renaissance of Machiavelli and his Italy of Florence, through John Stuart Mill back to the Athenian democracy of Plato in the Republic. We saw a fundamental dichotomy in how great books and great thinkers have approached this question. Is the individual there to serve the state, or does the state exist to serve the individual? And we found very profound minds on both sides of the question. And the more profound the mind, the more difficult it is to place them. Because you might say that Plato in the Republic says, yes, the state is there to serve the individual, to make that individual just. But the state must exercise considerable control in order to make that person just. And we tested whether a set of universal values existed in determining the character of that citizen who serves the state or is served by the state. And we saw that both Confucius and Socrates spoke of these fundamental values of wisdom, justice, moderation, and courage as we continue in our pursuit of whether there are indeed universal values accepted by all civilizations in all times. And we saw with John Stuart Mill the radical defense of the freedom of the individual, the absolute refusal to accept any form of control. And he was the very disturbed, for example, that Plato wanted to banish poets like Homer from the Republic as immoral influences. Let the individual decide. Our theme now is perhaps one of the most radical of individual decisions. It is love. Whom do you choose to love? Now, I tell you, Lord Acton said that religion and liberty had been the reasons for the greatest and worst acts in all of history. Well, I'm a great admirer of Lord Acton, but he was wrong. Love. Love is the greatest cause for good events and bad events. And while every one of us on a regular basis must deal with our government, from time to time even with our conscience, if we have one, all of us deal every day with the question of love. Someone we loved once, still married to, someone we're married to, we still love, someone we would like to marry, or somebody, you know, that we really do not like, but there they are. Love and hate. And it has been the subject of very great literature. Oh, my goodness. We would have a wealth. We could do a whole teaching company course just on great love poetry and great love novels. Why, we could take the Romeo and Juliet. Or we could have looked at the Aeneid just from the point of view of Dido, that tremendous love story in which the dutiful Aeneas must say no, no to Dido and go on with his task of founding Rome. I have chosen instead to look at the wonderful summary of the values of the Middle Ages that is Le Mort d'Arthur, The Death of Arthur, by Sir Thomas Mallory. And in the next lecture, we will look at the summary of the values of the Enlightenment in what is, in one fashion, a love poem, Goethe and the Faust but to Sir Thomas Mallory. He was an English knight. He served with distinction in the war of the Hundred Years' War in France, serving under the Earl of Warwick, and by the patronage of the Earl of Warwick was um, elected to Parliament. But in 1459, he fell afoul of life. He and a group of fellow knights broke into a monastery, beat up the monks, and robbed them. And he was thrown into jail. And such were his crimes that when most of them were pardoned, he stayed on and finally died in 1471, still in jail. But he used his time in jail, as Socrates would, or as Solzhenitsyn did, to come to grips with a fundamental question. And for him, it was love. And the magnificent story of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Now, Mallory's 
book is a great book. It has a great theme, and a theme that moves on two levels. Love, but the distinction between lust and true spiritual love, between carnal love and the love of the Spirit. Moreover, it is written in noble language. It is the first lengthy work of fiction in the English language in prose. And it is a vigorous prose that shows the foundation being laid for the English of the King James Version of the Bible. But above all, it is universal. The story of King Arthur in each generation awakens new movies, new novels, new comic books, all manner of heroes to be thought about and integrated into our culture and society. But more than that, it summarizes a culture at its apex, and that is the world of the Middle Ages. We saw that Dante's Divine Comedy does this, and the focus of Dante is on love, the love of God that will redeem Dante. And for medieval society, at the spiritual level, Christianity was the great religion of love. What is our passage? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. That is love. Gothic cathedrals, as we saw when we discussed Dante, are embodiments to this idea of divine love, which transports your soul out of yourself and up to the light of God. The same way that when you stand in a Gothic cathedral, you cannot look at the ground. Your eyes must go up to the light pouring through the windows. And the rose window of a Gothic cathedral is itself the symbol of God's love as shown through the rose, the flower that is the symbol of love, and through the light pouring through. And Thomas Mallory composes his great love story, the very height of the Gothic age. And even the dank prison cannot overwhelm his creative spirit as he tells the story. Because Arthur himself was an embodiment of the values of the Middle Ages, for it was not only an age of deep religious faith, it was also an age of chivalry, of knights and their ladies fair. Chivalry, feudalism, they gave the essence to the Middle Ages, this notion of trust and obligation. The knight who receives his land from his king and is bound to serve that king in trust and in honor. It was an age in which honor defined the code of relations between men and between men and women. Your word was all that counted. And honor was a complex nexus, as it was in the time of the Aeneid, in which you had to have a reputation and a commitment to integrity, courage, and you receive this both by, from the outside, people recognizing that reputation, and from within. So courage and honor. And it was an age of courtly love. When you weren't fighting wars and battles, you loved to hear minstrels sing tales of love. And in fact, it was the great Frederick II, the wonder of the world, as he was called, the uh, king of Naples in southern Italy, who first composed poetry in the Italian language in the form of love songs. So a king taking time from his duties to write about love. And the object of your love was frequently someone you could not have. It was the lady fair who was already married. And so you poured your heart out to her, this object to be worshipped from afar, Remember who guides Dante through heaven? It's Beatrice. Now, has she ever been his mistress? No. He has worshipped her only from afar. So this gives it in itself a kind of sacred character to the courtly love of the Middle Ages. However, it wasn't always just worshipping from afar. There was a great deal of infidelity. And if you could, you seduce the lady fair. And this notion of carnal love plays its role in the story of Arthur. But Arthur, the great hero who came to summarize the England of the 15th century, who as king of England ruled over not only the whole of the British Isles, but was emperor of Europe as well. Arthur, who 
with his knights of the round table, brought an age never to return for years to come of justice and glory to England, and a golden age symbolized by his great palace at Camelot. All of this was captured by Sir Thomas Mallory in his story of the death of Arthur, borrowing very heavily upon French works, for Arthur spread all over Europe, and some of the greatest songs about Arthur and tales and poetry were created in France. He lives in Italy, Spain, Germany. Who was Arthur, in fact? He was, just like the Agamemnon of the Iliad, a real person. There was an Arturus, who was a war leader in Britain in those dark days following the collapse of Roman rule. In fact, the Mort d'Arthur of Sir Thomas Mallory dates the time of Arthur to around 500 A.D. And we know from very fragmentary sources that in 500 A.D., Roman Britain, having been deserted by the Romans, the Celtic population, the people who had been there before the Romans came, who we might call Romano-Celtic because they still kept their, kept their Celtic language but also spoke Latin, were being driven far to the west by the invading Anglo-Saxons, those very people we met when we talked about Beowulf. And for one brief period, the Roman Britons rallied. And in a series of battles, stopped the tide of Anglo-Saxon conquest. And this even shows some justification in the archaeological record. And the legend lived on. And it lived on centered around one great figure, Arthur, who at the Battle of Mount Baden, where well, won a mighty victory over the Angles and Saxons and held them up for that brief period of time. Arthur, a mighty war leader, a dukes in battle, perhaps even having the title of king. That is a real figure around which then grew a series of tales kept alive by this Celtic-speaking people, and it is in the west of the British Isles, what we call Wales, that the Arthurian legend had its beginning even as he would be born in the west of England at Tintagel, the land of Cornwall. So Arthur was a real person, but even as with Agamemnon, around him clustered a series of marvelous events and marvelous figures, like Merlin the magician, the wonder worker, and the story of the Holy Grail. It too an embodiment of the search of the Middle Ages for salvation. The cup and dish out of which Jesus ate and drank on the Thursday of Passover. The Holy Grail, brought as legend would tell it from the Holy Land to Britain by Joseph of Arimathea, who himself became a wonder worker, a miracle worker, bringing that Holy Grail to England and to Britain where it would center around the monastery at Glastonbury. What is the tale of Arthur as Thomas Mallory gives it to us? He is the son of Uther Pendragon, a mighty warrior king who uh, is ruler over the western part of the British Isles and conceives a, an infatuation for the wife of the Duke of Tintagel. Egrain is her name. And the tale of Arthur begins with carnal love. The Duke wants her. So does King Uther Pendragon. Neither one of them wants to give up this beautiful lady. And so Merlin intervenes and he transports Uther Pendragon to the castle of the Duke of Tintagel while the Duke is away. And has Uther Pendragon assume the form of the Duke of Tintagel. So his wife doesn't know it's not her husband she's sleeping with. And all this time, Uther Pendragon is there. The Duke of Tintagel is being killed. And in fact, he is killed three hours before his wife embraces Uther Pendragon in the form of her husband. So Arthur is not a bastard, don't you see? Now, take this on faith. And having discovered this, the lady is quite willing now with her husband dead to marry Uther Pendragon. And thus Arthur is born, the father explains everyone, everything to all of his knights in waiting, and they too accept that Arthur is a real legitimate king. But Uther Pendragon dies, and Arthur is 
raised by wards and grows up to be a sturdy young man. And one day they are riding to, uh, to uh, an assembly at, uh, in London and the word goes out that the next king of England will be whosoever can draw this great sword out of a mighty stone. And all the nobles of England try to draw that sword out of the stone, but only this young boy, Arthur, achieves it. Well, the great knights can't believe this. This happens at Christmas time. They say, let's come back later. Once again, Arthur alone can draw it out. Well, let's come back at Easter time. Once again, Arthur draws it out and no one else can. Let's come back at Pentecost. Once again, Arthur draws it out. And finally, they agree that Arthur must be king of England. And so with the miracle, the king is born. With the miracle, the king assumes his power and even assumes his sword. That sword is not the sword that will follow him. It is a new sword, Excalibur, that is given to him by a strange woman in a lake far away in the west. Excalibur, cut steel, will be the sword of Arthur. And with that sword and with his innate goodness, he unifies first Britain and then the whole of Europe into one great kingdom, and he is emperor over it. And from his capital city at Winchester or Camelot, the knights come to, to settle and to serve him around their great table, round because everyone is equal there. And he weds the beautiful Guinevere out of love and cherishes her. So that is the age of Camelot as it flourishes. And of all those knights who are gallant, serving Arthur always in the cause of good, riding through the world on great errands to save maidens who are attacked by dragons, save maidens who are in boiling pots, save maidens who are imprisoned unjustly, always treating them with justice and kindness. Of all of these, the greatest of all the knights is Lancelot. Lancelot is the perfect knight, brave, courteous, and bold. He has only one flaw. He loves Queen Guinevere. He loves the wife of his sovereign. And you know what? She loves him too. Their love reaches out across the boundaries of marriage. Lancelot himself staying unwed to keep himself pure for his lady fair. One of his journeys he is riding and he comes to a strange castle and enters that castle and it is ruled over by King Peles. And in this Never Never Land, Lancelot asks King Peles, who are you? And Peles says, you know, I am cousin, first cousin as a matter of fact, to Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea who served our Lord? Yes, he is my first cousin. Oh, well, you don't wonder that that's 450 years later because Joseph of Arimathea, like all of these, lives miraculous ages. And King Pelle says, you know what? I would like you to sleep with my daughter, Elaine. Oh, no, I keep myself pure for one whose name I cannot speak. Yeah, but just sleep with her. I don't care. You don't have to marry her because the son that you will sire upon my daughter will be the perfect knight. No, 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 I will not do it. But thank you for the offer anyway. Well, King Peles, by his magic, transforms his daughter, Elaine, to look like Guinevere. And Lancelot does not seem surprised when she appears in his bed that night, so we, perhaps the love has not been quite as pure as we think of it. Anyway, thinking he is sleeping with Guinevere, he does, and goes away happy the next morning. And from her, Elaine, is born Galahad. And he truly is the perfect knight. He is raised by nuns and appears at Camelot, led by nuns, and comes into the great chamber where the round table is. And you know in Winchester, you can still see something that they claim is the round table. And there moves towards the one seat that has never been filled, the siege perilous, the dangerous chair. For the only person who dares sit in there is the one who is chosen by God to find the Holy Grail, to go out on that mission and achieve it. Anyone else will be struck dead immediately. And the young boy goes and, don't sit there, don't sit there. But he sits down. 
and suddenly there appears, just fluttering through the air, a chalice and wings of an angel over it. And then it disappears. But all have seen in this vision the Holy Grail. And they lift up the curtain that surrounds the siege perilous and read on it. 450 years after the death of our Lord, Galahad will begin his quest for the Holy Grail. But you are warriors and knights and men of honor. Why leave it to a boy to achieve this great gift? And so the whole of the round table now sets off to see if they cannot find the Holy Grail. And Arthur, Arthur, he is completely distraught. This is the end, he says, of the round table. So many of you, he says in truth, will never come back. You will die on this lonely errand. But off they go because they are men of honor and courage and deep faith. And Launcelot goes with them. Galahad goes with them carrying a shield that was originally pure white and now bears a red cross. A red cross from the blood that flowed from the nose of Joseph of Arimathea who made the cross upon it. And so they go in pursuit. Launcelot and his father pursuing together the Holy Grail. Together for six months they ride on a boat in a deep and dark and empty sea. Then they part again and Launcelot continues his quest alone. And he comes to a far off place for all of this is in a never never world, a world that once was and never will be again or never was and may be again comes to a tiny chapel in a far-off place and goes inside and there falls asleep. And in his sleep, once again, this chalice comes to him, this plate and cup. And out of it he sees a baby arise. And he can reach out and almost touch that cup. And he asks, what is this? And the voice answers, it is the cup out of which our Lord, to whom you are devoted, partook that last supper. Let me have it. No, you cannot. You are a noble knight, but you have this eternal sin, and you know what it is. He wakes up, and of course he knows what it is. It's his carnal love for Guinevere, and that will prevent him from ever seeing and holding and possessing the Holy Grail. He can only catch it from a distance in a dream. But Galahad, he is pure and has kept himself for this. And with three friends, with two friends, Sir Percival and Sir Bors, Galahad continues this quest. And he, he will find the Holy Grail. It will be shown to him. And not only will he be able to hold it in his hands, but he will see the figure of Christ rise out of that chalice, his hands still bleeding, his feet still bleeding, the wound in his side still fresh. And Christ himself will give him Galahad to partake of our Lord's own blood and flesh. And these two, Percival and Bors, accompany Galahad far off to the east, to the city of Saras, Whence came Joseph of Arimathea. And there, in a great shrine of gold and jewels, Galahad will put back the Holy Grail. And so content is he at having achieved this that he is happy now to die. And he passes away. And his friend Sir Percival stays with him there and in a short time joins Galahad in death. And Sir Bors, after performing many a wondrous deed against the infidel, the Turks, makes his way back to tell Arthur what has happened and to tell Launcelot the death of his son, but his immediate ascension into heaven for his goodness. But in Camelot, as Arthur foresaw, all is coming to ruin. Launcelot and Guinevere have allowed their lust to overcome them. And their affair has become the open secret of the entire court. Everyone knows about it but Arthur. And he, trusting in his wife, 
shuts his ears to any ill-fated rumors. But the rumors circulate again and again and again until finally he is told by close advisors like Sir Modred, jealous and envious of Arthur and of Lancelot, you must, you must show to the world that Guinevere is innocent. You must figure a way to prove it or prove to yourself what we all know that she is false to you and an adulteress. Go out on a hunting trip. Take Lancelot and all of us with you. It's the merry month of May when people are most vigorous in their lives. Go out hunting. And tell Guinevere you will not be back for several days and see what happens. And Arthur feels he must put his wife to this test and so he lets her know and they go off hunting and no sooner does night fall than the lusty Lancelot rides back in top fever to Guinevere and enters into her chamber. And Arthur comes back and discovers the truth. Guinevere and Lancelot go off together. And they stay together a few happy moments in his castle, the joyous guard, the joyous castle. And there they enjoy their forbidden love. But Arthur now, shamed, must wage war against Lancelot. Lancelot must leave Britain, go far off to Europe. And Arthur now, without Lancelot at his side, faces rebellion and revolt, led by Sir Modred. In a great battle, the armies of Arthur, the armies of good, clash with the armies of evil and rebellion in Sir Modred. And both Arthur and Modred are slain. As he lies dying, Arthur says, Take my sword, Excalibur. Take it to the lake and throw it in and come back and tell me what happens. And the knight comes back and said, I threw it in. It was nothing but waves and water. No, you didn't do it. Do it again. Threw it in. Nothing but waves and water, I tell you. You've still got it. I do. Throw it in. Come back. An arm of a woman came up and grabbed that sword and pulled it under. Now I can die. But did he die? Mallory says there are many who say that queens from the west took him away, far out to the islands, far, far in the sea. And there he still awaits a time when Britain will need him and he will come back. Arturus. Yamque Rex. Quae futurus, once king and he will be king again. And Lancelot and Guinevere, repenting of all that their carnal love has caused, become a nun and a monk, fasting, serving their Lord, till Lancelot hears the word that Guinevere has died. And he goes takes his beloved, her corpse, and leads her in a religious procession back to Glastonbury, where some men say Arthur is buried, and at least lays her down there beside the grave of the king they both love so much. And after that, he no longer can eat or drink. He has no joy in anything except to pray and to waste away and to die and be buried by those knights who once fought beside him so gallantly. So this tale of love, this tale of a search for the Holy Grail, becomes ultimately a story of redemption. The fact that you have sinned very, very greatly like Lancelot and Guinevere caused great trouble and destruction to those you loved. But God and the teaching of the Middle Ages can take away all of that sin, and so they die in the peace of God. It is a great love story. It is a great religious story. It is a book that profoundly speaks to the values of that Middle Age so remote from us in time and in spirituality. <laughs>